And we are having this program, especially to commemorate the 250th birth anniversary of Ram Mohan Roy. His birth anniversary falls, his 250th birth anniversary falls at the following year. And this is a year long celebration that we have been starting from this year, commemorating and leading to the great program. So we have over here today amongst us, Professor Clark Majli from the Sheffield Hallam University who will be speaking to us. And we also have the members of the committee of the Citizens Forum, uh, Shudokina Mukherjee, as well as Professor Jayati Gupto. So I would now request the convener of this session, Shudokina Kunda Mukherjee, to come up and say a few words. So Shudokina, can you please unmute yourself and speak? Thank you, Amit. Uh, at the very beginning, let me welcome all of you who have kindly made uh, it possible to attend this, uh, yourself to me attend this meeting. Now, Raja Ramun Roy was born at a crucial junction of the history of India. It was a watershed moment when power was getting transferred from the Orient to the Occident. The mighty Mughal Empire was disintegrating and regional power centers were raising their heads and fighting each other to gain control. The European merchants took the opportunity to expand their influence. It was a time of uncertainty among the natives, a time of great insecurity. Deep-rooted superstitions and bigoted religious practices threw the country to abysmal gloom and ignorance. Religious caste and class differences tore at the societal fabric, rendering India extremely vulnerable to the dominance of powers external to the subcontinent. Ram Mohan rose to mitigate the sufferings of the helpless masses through his crusades against blind adherence to meaningless religious, practice, meaningless religious practices and social oppression of the weaker sections of society. He was a Renaissance man who was influenced by the Western liberal thoughts to champion the cause of civil rights and liberty of individuals. He reinterpreted the ideals of the Indian civilization encompassed by the much broader term of Hinduism and led India to a more modern and cosmopolitan view of life. He is truly called the father of modern India. However, in his lifetime, Ramon was at the center of controversies due to his radical ideas. He earned as much uh, resentment as he commanded respect because of his imposing personality, his erudite tracts on all the major religions of the world, his humanitarian ideals, and his well thought of opinions on many aspects of our society polity, economics, and cultural heritage. Although India owns its awakening to the modern era, to Ram Mohan yet, he has not perhaps received the respect due to him. On the 25, 250th year of his birth, we from all walks of life who admire his great visionary, this great visionary and organizer, have come forward to celebrate the Sester Centennial birth anniversary in a befitting manner. It is a joint endeavor of many organizations who have agreed to collaborate and share their individual efforts on a common platform so that each and every program has greater visibility. We are planning to hold monthly lectures on the multifaceted work of the Raja. Due to the present pandemic scenario, we are holding the lectures on the digital platform. However, we intend to collect the lectures and publish a commemorative volume next year when the 250th year comes to an end. We also plan to join the program of the different organizations which may or may not be part of this forum. We intend to use this forum to share all the in, uh, information and invitation to such programs so that we may be able to bring his ideals into focus and 
make it accessible to the public as we feel that Raja Ram Moon Roy's ideas have become as relevant in the present context as it was in his faction ridden dogmatic times. I again extend our heartiest welcome to all of you who have taken an interest and have kindly joined our inaugural session. Thank you. So, so thank you, Shudokhina, uh, for those words. So how, we will start the program by one of the songs composed by Ram Mohan. The song is in Bengali, and I'll be playing a recording of that. Ha <laughs> So that was a song which was one of the famous songs of Ram Mohan, Habo Shayake. So well, now I will invite Professor Jyoti Ghosh to kindly introduce the main speaker of today, Professor Flaz Mechri, to the audience. Yes, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Yeah. On behalf of the Citizens Forum, uh, it is my privilege to introduce the speaker of this evening's lecture, Dr. Claire Meachley, Professor Emerita at Sheffield Hallam University, United Kingdom. Dr. Meachley was president of the International Federation for Research in Women's History from 2010 to 2015 and is a former editor of the journal Gender and History, a very prestigious journal. Her
Her research focuses on connections between the history of women and the history of the British Empire. Among her key publications are Women Against Slavery, 1992, Gender and Imperialism, 1998, Feminism and Empire, 2007, and Women in Transnational History, 2016. She is currently working on a study of 19th century networks of liberal religion and social reform, which explores links between Bengali, American, and British activists. She has already published a number of articles relating to the project entitled Cosmopolitan Feminists and is completing a book of, uh, for Manchester University Press. Professor Midgley has lectured on Ram Mohan in Bangladesh on her area of interest at the University of Calcutta and Jawaharlal Nehru University, amongst you know, many others. Incidentally, she has learned Bangla to access archival material for her research and is well conversant in uh, Bangla. So I welcome uh, Professor Midgley to speak on uh, this topic uh, that she has suggested. The title of her lecture today is Ram Mohan Roy and the Entangled History of Bengali and Western Reformers. So uh, may I invite uh, Professor Claire Midgley uh, to deliver her lecture. Good evening, everybody. As you can see, my Bengali and my Bangla pronunciation is terrible. And um, I apologize for that. But it's lovely to be asked to do this talk. And I'd like to particularly thank uh, Dr. Jati Gupta for um, inviting me and the Kolkata Citizens Forum for including this at, at the beginning of their series of talks on uh, Raja Ramahan Roy. Um, first of all, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we can. Please go ahead. Oh, excellent. Good. Okay, so I'm just going to launch into the talk now. I think I'm going to talk for about half an hour, and I'll trust Amit to shut me up if I go on too long. No problem. So we'll do that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so at the moment, I'm still a small figure on the screen, not in the main screen, I think, Amit. It's probably because you're hosting it, is it? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So um, basically, there's a huge literature out there in both Bengali and English about Ramahan Roy. He's been celebrated by many as the father of modern India, the founder of an influential new religious movement, the Brahmo Shamaj, and the initiator of the Bengal Renaissance. Others have debunked him as a caste and class privileged elitist and a colonial collaborator. Recent scholarship has peeled away many of the myths that have built up around his life, offering more accurate biographical accounts and more nuanced interpretations of his significance. What then can I tell you about this towering figure, which you might not know already? Well, over the last 10 years or so, I've been studying the long history of cooperation between members of the Brahmo Shamaj and British and American Unitarians. The Brahmo Shamaj, as of course you all know, was, is a movement for religious and social reform among Hindus, which Ramahan initiated in your city of Kolkata almost 200 years ago. Unitarian was, and is, a strand of Protestant Christianity which rejected the doctrine of the Holy Trinity and, like Brahmoism, adhered to a strict monotheism and was also in the vanguard of social reform. So my main concern in my own research project has been to explore cross-cultural collaboration on this woman question. In other words, debates around the social position of women and activities to improve that position. It's well known that Brahmos and Unitarians played leading and progressive roles in these debates and campaigns in their respective homelands.
but their history of collaborative work on the woman question, beginning in the 1820s and continuing through the 19th century, though with some interruptions, is less well known or understood, and that is the focus of my own study. At the foundation of this collaboration lies the towering figure of Ramahan Roy himself. He was the one who initiated Hindu reformers' cooperation with Western Unitarians on matters of both religious and social reform. He was the person who drew British Unitarian women into the campaign against Sati or widow burning and who so impressed the leading English social reformer, Mary Carpenter, that she, when she encountered him as a young girl, that she developed a concern for the plight of Indian women that would lead her as an adult to work energetically with members of the Brahmo Shamaj to try to improve the education of girls and women in Bengal and beyond. So, a key question I had in mind when I embarked on this research project was, how did Ramahan Roy come to form such strong links with Western Unitarians, links which rarely underpinned its long history of collaboration on the woman question? So that's the question I want to focus on answering in this short talk. Though, of course, afterwards there'll be some time for questions and, and welcome questions about the broader aspects of my work on the uh, woman question. Ramahan's close links with Western Unitarians date back to Kolkata in 1819 to 21, a decade before he founded the Brahmo Shamaj. Kolkata was then fast becoming the second city of empire, transforming from a key trading hub of the British East India Company to the governmental base of the company Raj. The city was not only the center of expanding British colonial power in the subcontinent, but also a cosmopolitan port city with a diverse and growing population. Ramahan, born in 1772, just after the company seized control over Bengal, settled in Kolkata in 1815. There, he gained fluency in English and became prominent in Bengali intellectual circles, part of the emerging Baudrillard middle class in the city. This group not only worked for the new colonial administration, but also developed a new civic culture of its own, forming institutions and associations and founding newspapers and periodicals. Ramaham himself played a leading role in these initiatives. And one of the new organizations he set up was the Atmiya Shaka, or Friendly Society. Through this, he sought to challenge Orthodox Brahmin priests and promote a monotheistic interpretation of Hindu sacred texts, arguing that their essential message was of the unity of the Supreme Being. Interestingly, the first Anglican Bishop of Kolkata, with whom Ramahan discussed his plan to form the group, wrote that Ramahan had said he was planning to form a, quote, Unitarian society, but that the Bishop had dissuaded him from using that term, doubtless because he himself was very hostile to Unitarianism as a Trinitarian Christian. And also in an English language letter published in 1819, Ramahan refers to the Atmiya Shava as the Brahmu or Unitarian Hindu community. So this suggests to me that he'd already begun to identify his religious group as Brahmos, and to translate this into English as Unitarian Hindus. At just this time, evangelical Protestant missionaries were becoming increasingly active in Bengal, following the British government's official endorsement of their presence in 1813. British Baptist missionaries already had a firm base in the Danish enclave of Serampore outside Kolkata. Ramahan, an eclectic religious reformer, was very keen to find out more about Christianity. While Baptist missionaries were hopeful that Ramahan's Hindu monotheism marked a staging post on his conversion to Christianity. This is a constant theme in Unitarian Brahma interactions, this never quite fulfilled hope that there'll be a conversion. So a positive exchange opened up. 
Baptist applauded Ramahan's public opposition to Sati, while Ramahan was deeply impressed by the ethical teachings of Jesus. In 1820, Ramahan started meeting regularly with the Baptist missionary William Adam, who was working to extend missionary work within Calcutta itself. Seeking to make Jesus' teachings more accessible to Bengalis, the two men jointly embarked on new translations of the Gospels to correct inaccuracies in the existing missionary translation. Ramahan's studies led him to become convinced that these biblical texts did not actually lend support to the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, the belief in the divinity that Jesus Christ partakes in the divinity, in divinity. Not surprisingly, um, so um, in 1820, he published a book, a pamphlet called The Precepts of Jesus, which promoted Christian ethical teachings while rejecting Orthodox Christian doctrines. Not surprisingly, this caused outrage among the Baptist missionary leaders, leading to a bitter pamphlet war. However, they were even more alarmed when their colleague, William Adam, the missionary, the Baptist missionary, influenced by his friend Ramahan, publicly rejected Trinitarianism and avowed himself a Unitarian. Excommunicated from chapel and sacked from his missionary position, Adam was derided in Baptist circles as, quote, the second fallen Adam. And Ramahan was transformed from friend into enemy in the eyes of the Sarampore missionaries. To quote, the heathen Ramahan Roy converting a missionary, how we are fallen. So such were the dramatic circumstances in in which William Adam and Ramahan Roy got together to jointly found an organization called the Calcutta Unitarian Committee in September, 1821. Now, I've got a bit of a beer in my bond about this organization because I think it's really been uh, very neglected and dismissed by historians. But in fact, I think that to understand the origins of the Brahmosh Maj and the origins of Unitarian Brahma Cooperation, you need to look at this organization. And quite a lot of my talk now is going to be about this organization. And um, I've also been able to draw on some sources that haven't been used before, namely the minute books of the organization that are now housed in Dr. Williams Library in London. So I'm hoping here I might bring something a little bit new to the table about uh, Ramahan. So the Calcutta Unitarian Committee sought to bring together Ramahan's Hindu monotheist friends with Western residents of Calcutta who were Unitarian Christians. For Ramahan, the committee acted as a new associational focus following the demise of his Atmiya Shabha in 1819, so this is founded in 1821. For Adam, unemployed and ostracized by his former missionary brothers, formal collaboration with Ramahan opened up the prospect of funding, employment contacts, and entry into the city's elite cosmopolitan networks. The Kirti also provided a space within which to foster broader interfaith collaboration. It brought into voluntary collaboration on an equal basis, European and Indian, Hindu and Christian, and, and it created what I've labeled a cosmotopian, cosmotopian, like combining the idea of cosmopolitan with the idea of utopian, a cosmotopian space within this colonial environment in Kolkata. Of course, it was a very imperfect cosmotopia. It was exclusively male. It was socially exclusive in class and caste terms. It involved educated professionals and merchants on the Western side and Western educated Brahmins on the Bengali side. And the committee also included no Muslim members. The absence of Muslims is not surprising given that the committee's stated 
committee stated that its primary object was, quote, to promote the knowledge, belief, and practice of the principles of Unitarian Christianity throughout British India. Why then did Ramahan co-found a committee which combined an interfaith membership with an apparently restricted single faith hey, objective? The answer lies in the careful wording of the objects of the committee. They avoided the standard evangelical Christian missionary language of, quote, converting the heathen. And they emphasized the diffusion of religious knowledge and principles rather than the imposition of Christian doctrine. Thus, the committee positioned itself as an endeavor to open up Indian hearts and minds to, quote, rational and, quote, true religion, but it left these terms open to both Christian and Hindu inflections or interpretations. It also laid out an ambitious pathway for achieving its objectives to which Christian Unitarian and Hindu monotheists could both contribute through the promotion of philanthropy and rational education in ways which were explicitly defined as, quote, not in immediate connection with Christianity. In practice, Adam and Ramahan pursued the committee's agenda in distinctive but complementary ways. Ramahan established a boys' school offering free instruction with the aim of, quote, the renovation and improvement of the Hindu character. He also founded the Unitarian Press, which public tra published tracts promoting both Unitarian Christianity and Hindu monotheism and social reform. And he opened the Calcutta Theological Library, a free resource promoting the comparative study of religion. Meanwhile, Adam set about establishing a ministry in Calcutta, holding services open to both Western Unitarian Christians and Bengali monotheists. He was also keen to try to launch a Unitarian Christian mission in India and sought overseas aid from leading Unitarian ministers in both Britain and the United States. The response of these ministers was cautious. As Unitarians, they did not believe in the doctrine of original sin. They did not feel an urgent call to, quote, save heathen souls. Henry Ware, professor of divinity at Harvard College, who was already an admirer of Ramahan's pioneering comparative study of religion, independently sent both Adam and Ramahan a list of 20 searching questions concerning, quote, the prospects of Christianity and the means of promoting its reception in India. He wanted to determine whether a Unitarian mission was a good idea and had any prospect of success. This must be about the only time that um, missionaries, Christian missionaries, have consulted with people they saw as heathens about whether or not it was a good idea to do a mission, I think. Adam's response articulated a specifically Unitarian approach to foreign mission that he developed through his involvement in the Kolkata Unitarian Committee. This presented it as a very long-term project which had to begin not by attempting dramatic conversions of the, quote, heathen, but by founding schools to spread, quote, the universally acknowledged simple and rational truths of religion rather than Christian dogma. And also by gaining support from, quote, intelligent natives who must themselves ultimately be the chief instruments for the propagation of Christianity. Ramahan's approach was subtly different. Ramahan's response to Ware was subtly different. Asked directly by Ware whether he thought it desirable that Indians be converted to Christianity, he articulated his universalist belief that fundamental religious truths transcended specific religious traditions. In his words, I pause to answer as I'm led to believe from reason what is set forth in the scripture, that in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh, worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
and Ramahan added, in whatever form of worship, he may have been taught to glorify God. He made it clear that it was Jesus as a moral example, not Christianity as a set of religious doctrines that he, had valued, that he valued. True religion, he argued, could triumph in India if American Unitarians sent out not missionaries, but rather teachers of European learning and science and Christian morality, unmingled with religious doctrines. So Adam was clearly still a Christian missionary at heart, struggling to find the best way to eventually achieve conversions, while Ramahan did not see the necessity for conversion at all, as he rejected the idea that true religion was the exclusive preserve of Christianity. This was the tension between their perspectives that was to run through their work on the Calcutta Unitarian Committee. Nevertheless, they were able to sustain their close cooperation for an impressive period of eight years. And that was mainly through their efforts in stressing areas of common ground and in pursuing through the way they managed to pursue complementary but not identical initiatives. In 1826, Adam made a second and, Adam made a and a more successful appeal for funds from overseas, which enabled him to be formally employed by the Calcutta Unitarian Committee as Unitarian minister and missionary. He commenced public services for Unitarian Christians, and alongside that he delivered evening talks on religion aimed at both Hindus and Europeans interested in, quote, the doctrine of the unity of God considered in its various relations, both to Trinitarianism and to polytheism and idolatry. And he launched a weekly, quote, native service in English intended to, quote, form a point of union between Christian and Hindu Unitarians against polytheism and idolatry through focusing on the inculcation of moral and religious obligations on rational principles. Unfortunately, however, attendance at all these events started well, but soon began to dwindle, perhaps because, rumour has it, Adam was not actually a very good or charismatic speaker. And it seems that the novelty of his um, sort of focus soon wore off for many people. So in 1827, at his suggestion, the Calcutta Unitarian Committee was reconstituted as the British Indian Unitarian Association in the hopes of expanding its influence beyond the city. Adam hoped the move would persuade Unitarians in Britain and America to put more resources into a proper Christian mission in India, while Ramaham was keen to encourage, quote, all Unitarians, whether Christian or Hindu, to form auxiliary associations outside Calcutta, a kind of network of organizations. This attempt to revive the fortunes of the organization, however, failed. And in June 1828, Adam decided he could no longer justify his salary as missionary and minister and sent in a resignation letter to his Unitarian supporters in Britain and America. The manuscript minute book of the Calcutta Unitarian Committee in the Dr. Williams Library throws important new light on the relationship between the demise of the committee, the Unitarian Committee, and the emergence of Ramahan's independent new organization, the Brahmo Shamaj. A few days after Adam wrote his resignation letter, he circulated to the old Calcutta Unitarian Committee, now British, Indian Unitarian Association, I just referred to it as the Calcutta Unitarian Committee to make it easier. He circulated to the committee members a letter from the new, a newly formed organization, the Hindu Unitarian Association. This he described as, quote, an institution just formed in the city with a view to extend the knowledge and worship of one God among the Hindus in opposition to the prevalent idolatry. He proposed that a grant of 500 rupees be made by the Unitarian Committee to this new Hindu association. Quote, 
as proof of the interest we take in their proceedings and in order to strengthen that friendly feeling which already happily exists between Hindu, Christian and Hindu Unitarians. Well, the founder of this new organization, the Hindu Unitarian Association, was Ramahan Roy. Since the beginning of the year, 1828, Adam has been encouraging him to form a Hindu Unitarian Society in Kolkata. But Adam had expected it to be set up as an auxiliary to the existing British Indian Unitarian Society. And he'd harbored the hope that it would only be nominally Hindu and would lay the ground for Unitarian Christianity. Ramahan had, had other ideas. He may indeed initially have considered positioning his new organization as an auxiliary. However, he decided to found an independent organization. This was probably both because the Calcutta Unitarian Committee was already clearly failing as an organization and because, and perhaps more importantly, because he hoped a new independent group would attract a much wider range of Hindus, those who supported religious and social reform, but would never associate themselves with any group linked to even the most liberal Christian missionary agenda. Adam was deeply disappointed. Writing in January 1829 to his American Unitarian friends that he now realized the religious identity of the new group was to be explicitly based on the Hindu Vedas with no reference to Christian scriptures. However, although he told Ramahan he deeply disapproved of his decision, it didn't cause a deep rift between the two men. Ramahan continued to serve on the Kolkata Unitarian Committee um, until it was formally wound up at Adam's instigation at the end of 1829. I'm going on about dates here, but they're quite important because um, it, it shows the sort of sequence which led towards the Brahma Shamaj being created. The dissolution of this organization, the Calcutta Unitarian Committee, which had originally been founded by Adam in 1821, meant that Ramahan and his close friend, wealthy businessman Dwakanath Tagore, who had been key financial supporters of the old committee, were now free to focus their funds on creating a permanent place of worship for their new group in Calcutta. By 1830, when this place of worship opened, Ramahan had ceased to refer to the group as the Hindu Unitarian Association. It had become the Brahmo Shamaj. Succeeding, as he hoped, in attracting a wider range of Hindu members than the earlier interfaith committee, Ramahan developed new forms of divine worship, which eschewed idolatry and animal sacrifice, and promoted a social reform agenda focused particularly on opposition to sati. However, he retained his desire to reach out beyond the Hindu community. The trust deed for the new place of worship stated that the Brahma Shamaj would welcome people without distinction for the worship of the author and preserver of the universe, and for the promotion of charity, morality, piety, benevolence, virtue, and the strengthening of bonds of union between men of all religious persuasions and creeds. Thus, the cosmopolitanism manifested in the Calcutta Unitarian Committee didn't vanish with the demise of that organization. Rather, it immediately manifested itself in new form. Ramahan, long in close con correspondence on matters of religion and social reform with Western Unitarians, continued to cultivate these friendships. And these relationships were cemented during his extended visit to Britain in 1831. I'm coming towards the conclusion now. So to make a few concluding points, Scholars have argued about how important Unitarian Christianity was in shaping Ramahan's religious sure thought and the nature of the Brahmo Shamaj. I think what they have missed in adopting a rather unidirectional, one direction model of cross-cultural impact is the rich reality 
the interactive cross fertilization across the Hindu Christian religious divide that developed between Christian Unitarians and Hindu monotheists during the 1820s. As I hope I've suggested in this talk, these cross currents of influence centered on the cosmopolitan colonial city, Calcutta, and the cosmopolitan cosmotopian hub formed by the Calcutta Unitarian Committee. The spokes radiating out from this hub comprise the transnational network of kindred spirits united by a strong sense of spiritual fellowship, which crossed East-West, colonizer, colonized, and Christian Hindu divide. These spokes connected leading Unitarian ministers and reformers in Britain and the USA with Ramahan Roy and the Ramos Maj. And I would argue that it was this sense of spiritual fellowship which came to form a bedrock of trust, which enabled future cross-cultural collaboration between Brahmos and Unitarians on questions of social reform, particularly the woman question. I've added a little coda here, given that this is about um, uh, commemoration and anniversaries. Sadly, Ramhan died in the city far away from home over the Black Sea in the city of Bristol in England in 1833, after about two, spending about two years in the country. Later, his friend Dwarkaneth Tagore erected an impressive funerary monument in his memory there in the city, in this, this Arnold's Grove Cemetery. It is certainly worth paying a pilgrimage to see it if you're ever in Britain. Ramahan's closest friend in Bristol was Unitarian Minister Lant Carpenter. He was the father of Mary Carpenter, who after Ramahan's death wrote a sonnet in his honour, which praised him as the saviour of Indian women from Sati, contrasting to most of the British accounts, which gave all the credit to uh, the Governor General, then Governor General Bentinck. This is the Mary Carpenter who became the famous social reformer and who some 30 years after Ramahan's death decided to devote herself to working with the Brahmo Samaj in the cause of female education. The physician who attended Ramahan on his deathbed was John Bishop Estlin, another Unitarian. And it was his daughter, Mary, who in the 1880s donated the original cast which her father had taken of Ramahan's face after his death to the Shadaran Brahmo Shamaj, the sort of progressive pro-female emancipation wing of the Brahmo Samaj that emerged in the late 1870s. She had carefully preserved this death mask for 50 years in her home. And when I visited Kolkata 11 years ago, I was so excited to see it on display in the newly opened Ramahan Roy Museum now painted black. I hope I have the opportunity to visit your city again in the near future, once this terrible pandemic is finally over. Kolkata is the city that my mother was born in, so it has a special place in my heart. Sadly, Ma died a few months ago, so it seems fitting that I'm talking to you today from her flat in Edinburgh. Just down the road from me is a museum connected to the university, which contains a copy of the death mask of Raja Ramahan Roy. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Medley. That was a very entertaining talk and the way <clears throat> that you had elucidated the relationship between the Unitarian Committee and the, and the formation of the Brahma Samaj. It's really very nice uh, to learn about it, especially the historical part. Thank you. Thank you. And as regards the death masks uh, that you have said, so I think the Ram Mohan Museum, uh, I think the one that they have over there, the Ram Mohan Museum, uh, the cast that they have over there, I think it's a copy of the one which is currently the Bongyo Shahitya Porishad, I think, holds the original one. So it is a copy. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you for telling me that. I thought it was the original. 
Yeah, and I believe there has been uh, uh, Shagota Ghosh and Shuman Ghosh, they have really done some study as well as Oni Sanyal. So you may have seen that they have done on the road to the Raja. So uh, uh, I mean, uh, Kala Contractor and Oni Sanyal. Uh, oh, yeah. This Edinburgh College and uh, found out that, I think there were two death masks. One was discovered later. Uh -huh. Yes, because um, I think um, Eslin made the death mask because he was asked to by someone called George Kuhn, yeah. who was a the leading phrenologist of the time right. and trying to read people's characters from their head shape and so on. And apparently he was incredibly impressed by Ramahun Roy's head because he said it was so huge. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, uh, I will be sharing with you. Uh, they, have, they have made a video of that. So there are two death masks. One is the white one, and there's a one which has been a later copy. So I'll share uh -huh. you the video links. So you can have that would be lovely. Thank you. Uh, so may I request uh, Professor Joyati Ghosh to give a vote of thanks, and then we'll open it up for questions. And before that, and then we'll I, I think, have... you know, shall we take the questions first? Yeah, fine. So then we'll do it this way. So we'll have the questions. Then we'll have Professor Joyati Ghosh giving us the vote of thanks. Then I think uh, Dr. Shushma Jog is there. She'd be saying the closing uh, stotra. So all of you, if you have any questions, uh, can you just unmute yourselves and ask the question to Professor Mishri? I think some of them are putting it on the chat box. Okay. So... Uh, there is one from Kaveri Narang. She is saying, "Did you did your research reveal what were the origins of the strong interest and empowerment and emancipation of women, so unusual in a man of his times?" Yes, um, this is something um, I think um, quite a lot of people have uh, recently. Been writing questions. questions. I'm sorry. Co no. um, there's been quite yeah. a bit of research about this recently um i'm i'm just trying to struggling with the name in my head of <laughs> very famous per <laughs> professor who's done some work on this but um yes i mean the connections have been made with his own experiences in his family um, um of um the treatment of women um so seeing a, one of the roots for his um, focus on female emancipation is being in his um, upset at how um, things were for the women within his own family, which I think was kind of an interesting um, um, insight into, well, because obviously some, for some men that might be a reason simply to follow the same line as your male relatives, but for him, he seems to have questioned it. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, I'm struggling with the name of the famous scholar who's written about this. Um, I, it'll come back to me in a minute. Would it be Brian Hatcher? No, uh, um, she works at a De university in Delhi. Um, she's been Tanika bullied. Saka? Tonika yeah. Saka. Tanika Saka. Yeah. Tonika. yeah. Yeah. The next question comes from Krishna Bosch. Uh, could you reflect on the prominent Bengali or Indian women who may have joined the movement at that time? Yes. Um, what I found in the course of my study is that um, women, be um, Bengali women, became very active in the Brahma Shamaj from about the 1860s onwards. Um, I have not um, come across a lot of evidence for women's involvement um, in the movement earlier than that. In the 1860s, you have uh, women's organizations being founded. You've got the Bubble Wadini Portrica, the journal um, set up, which gave a space for women's own writings. Um, so this seems to be in the time when the, the women's activism, women's own activism really uh, took off. Okay. There's another question which comes from Mr. Arup Das. He's saying, uh, he has looked at the article that you had mentioned. 
He said, uh, was it these two great men who drove this cultural collaboration or there were others involved as well? Okay. Um, uh, yes. Um, well, I haven't even listed all the members of the Kolkata Unitarian Committee, for example. Um, so I haven't got the names just in front of me at this minute. Um, it's all detailed in my article, in which you can get free online in the journal Itinerario. Um, I can send the details I mean, to you and to Jati. So yeah. Jati already has them, I think. But um, yeah, so there was a collection of um, Ramahan Circle right. uh, who were engaging with a collection of... Um, uh -huh. Um, um, Christian Unitarians in Kolkata um, but then also they connected up with the most prominent Unitarian leaders ministers in both Bengal, uh, both England Britain and um, the United States so um, although these two men in a sense were the initiators of this connection um, it very rapidly spread out, not just to the group within Kolkata, but with it to these international links as well. Um, William Adams is a very interesting figure. He's not really known. He's not famous like Ramahun Roy. <laughs> he's quite an obscure figure, but he went on to found a utopian community in uh, Massachusetts in the United States and got very involved in the radical anti-slavery movement there. That's that's interesting. So this Calcutta Unitarian Association would be the one that was in the office of the Bengal Harakara, right? On the first floor. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There you know so, about it. It pops up mentions in, in in various people's accounts, but in my opinion, everyone rather dismisses it yeah. <laughs> as unimportant and insignificant. Uh, there's another you, question which comes from Sukanya Bhadra. Uh, she's saying, I am wondering if Reverend William Gaskell was the husband of the women novelist Elizabeth Gaskell. Ah, yes. Elizabeth Gaskell was indeed married to a Unitarian minister. I can't remember if his first name was William or not, but um, I guess that probably is Elizabeth Gaskell's husband. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next question is, did you find information that Ramon was deeply affected by the voluntarily committing of the sati by his sister-in-law that moved him to actively get involved in the social reform? Well, this is the area which I have yet to go into more in my own research, but I do understand that um, Tanika Sakar has uncovered quite a bit of new material around these issues, around the... Um, it, you know, the reasons why Ramahan first got in, in, in engaged. So I'd really recommend reading, going to look at uh, Tanika Shakar's work on this. Jati, do you know a good reference for that? Uh, that Hindu woman, uh, Hindu, a uh, bride Hindu woman, are you talking about that uh, by Tanika? Shortcut? No, no, her most recent, most recent work. No, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't think yeah. that. Uh, I think it you know. may just be published in articles at the moment. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, next question comes, please add your remarks on Raja Ramohan Roy's work in socially, economically belonging women. Okay. So the, area which I have done um, have, have done a little bit of research on so far is his involvement in the campaign against Sati widow burning and um, one thing I in fact this campaign was what first made me years ago find out about Ramahan Roy because I'm not trained my original areas of study were not um, Indian history or Bengali history um, that's not my background. Um, um, and I came across um, Ramahan Roy first when I was doing some research on women, British women making petitions to Parliament. And I was working on the women's petition to Parliament against slavery, Caribbean slavery. 
in the eight, from eight, which they started petitioning Parliament from 1830. And I was amazed to discover that this was, um, you know, not a done thing for women to organ groups of women to organize petitions to Parliament in Britain at that time. So I was amazed about that. But then I was even more amazed to discover about a year before they started petitioning Parliament about slavery in the Caribbean, they sent a whole set of petitions to Parliament against Sati. Um, and um, many of these petitions came from groups of Unitarian women, Unitarian congregations. Um, at the time, I knew nothing whatsoever about Ramahan Roy, <laughs> but um, I was very made very curious by this fact. Why had these women suddenly started sending these petitions? And initially, I thought it was because of missionaries, Christian missionary activity in Kolkata and that they were getting appeals from Christian missionaries about this topic. But um, as I've gone more into it, I've realized that a lot of the women were from these Unitarian groups, not from Baptist groups or these other evangelical Christian groups. And I think it's clear that the reasons they were doing these petitions was because they were inspired by Ramahan Roy. May I ask so, you a question now? Yes. May I ask you a question? Uh, now, uh, you have been talking about Ramon's connection with the colonial woman's question. Now, Ramon's own attitude to the women of his own household, it was quite conservative. So do you think that his responses or reactions to, against Sati was an offshoot of his uh, critique of orthodox Hinduism? I think that... Uh, um, this is really not something I'm an expert on, but I would say that it's it certainly, um, that must have been a major factor in it, that his, his much wider criticism of practice within Orthodox Hinduism, which he thought were superstitious, were, um, you know, unsavory, were, um, didn't, he's very much, um, a rationalist. He believed in using reason and um, 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 he hated anything which seemed to be superstitious um, and um, underpinned by irrational beliefs. So I would guess that that is certainly um, a, a major reason why yeah. he might have been objected to Zati. Because, you know, as we go through the various discourses that he uh, has, uh, that he uh, and writes on Sati, it is usually about the Hindu Shastra and whether there is a sanction for Sati in the Hindu Shastra, what Manu says, what other uh, Upanishads and other uh, Shastras says, but not much on women and their suffering. I mean, women as a living entity and their suffering is not so much highlighted as what is there in, as the Shastric sanctions are, you know. So that's yeah. that kind of... Um, I think um, one element, uh, reason behind that may have been that he was um, generating information that could be used by the colonial government to argue that um, they could regulate against Sati, which they did in 1829, without... Um, contravening or interfering in Hindu religion, which was a big concern at the time that yes. they didn't want to um, be see, create unnecessarily tension um, by, um, you know, kind of taking action against aspects of Hindu religious practices. And so when Cavendish Bentinck, William Cavendish Bentinck, makes his regulation against Sati. He uses, a lot of the arguments he uses are not, this is an abominable, horrendous, inhuman mm -hmm. practice. A lot of them are about um, drawing on Ramahan's arguments that the Hindu scriptures don't actually stipulate support. that this is, this, yeah, support it. Thank you. We have another question. Was Ramahan's interest in Unitarianism a stage in his evolution of deep belief in the supremacy of the Upanishadic concept of the Supreme Being. I'm trying to see, can you, I can see that written down because I didn't quite get you. Is that in the list? 
Yeah, that is by, by Kaveri Naran, if you can see that. Uh, How are we doing for time? Uh, oh, I've seen it now. Sorry, I've seen it now, yes. Um, um, a station even if... Yes, I think, um, as far as I understand your question, I think so. I think that he was attracted to Unitarianism, Christian Unitarian. He, he in a sense, um, in a sense, he discovered Christian Unitarianism or himself through his own readings of the Bible, where he came to his own conclusion that the biblical text didn't actually support the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Um, and he, he at, it was sort of at the same time and he was discovering there was in fact a strand within Western Christianity which adopted the same perspective he had sort of developed of his own accord about the unity of uh, God. Um, so um, I, I'm not quite sure if I would say that Ramahan's interest in Unitarian was a stage as more that he saw in Unitarian form of Christianity something which is very sort of parallel to his Hindu-based monotheistic um, belief. Does that sound sensible and plausible to you? I think so. Yeah, if you I see think, um, he started from the Kufatul uh, Muhaddin when he's talking about monotheism, it's a gradual development. He's studying all the scriptures. So I believe it's a gradual development that he would be sticking to, you know, monotheism rather than, you know, various yeah. gods and goddesses. Yeah, Joyti, sorry, I, I stopped you were saying oh, something. I, I, I just wanted to say that how are we doing for time, I think. Yeah, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. So maybe we can, it's the last uh, uh, request. If anyone has any questions, otherwise we'll ask uh, Professor Joyti Guho to give us the, Joyti Gupta to give us the vote of thanks. I think, um, Question. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, Krishna Bose, the sister of Kaveri Narang. I think what Kaveri was trying to explore was there also, um, which Kerr referred to at the end, was that Ramon was not only moved by looking at Christian um, concepts, but he was initially moved by uh, thinking about the monotheistic aspect also in Hinduism and then looked perhaps for a parallel uh, process or vision of Christianity. Um, I think that was the question, to what extent was he influenced by his own reflection of Hinduism and the original concepts uh, in the Upanishad and not yeah. primarily by looking at Christianity and Christian texts? Yes, I think um that's I, I would say that's certainly the case. He published some of his early works about um, theism or as he called it theism or the monotheistic system of the Vedas. I think they came out around um, 1819, 1820 time. Um, he was already developing these ideas before he um, kind of um, started his deep study of the Bible. So I would say that's the order. And I believe that some scholars have also argued that he was drawing on various different religious traditions, that he was also, there was a certain amount of influence coming from Islam as well um, on Ramahan Roy. Um, I don't know how many scholars agree with that, but, but um, the, and, and clearly a variety of strands within Hinduism, as I understand it, were, were influence him in him. So he was a very eclectic, I think, as a thinker. 
um, but he was also very rooted in his own cultural background, clearly. Thank you. That was very well said. Yes, we understand he was influenced by Islam as well. Okay, so now may I request uh, Professor Jyoti Gupta to give a vote of thanks? Yes, uh, a big thank you to Professor Claire Midgley for, I think, you know, setting the tone of future events of the forum uh, by delivering this lecture on Ramon because it has generated a lot of questions and a lot of interest, uh, which uh, I think, you know, establishes his continuing uh, relevance uh, in the contemporary world. And uh, especially, uh, I think, uh, uh, Professor Mejli's uh, use of rare archival material uh, and talking about uh, the relationship of Unitarianism and uh, the Brahmo religion. Uh, she has given a prehistory of the Brahmo Samaj. And um, again, you know, located in uh, Kolkata, uh, our very own Kolkata. So, um, uh, Professor Mijli has been very kind in answering uh, this entire range of questions. I'm sure there are more questions and, you know, uh, I, I suppose uh, one can be in touch uh, with uh, Professor Mijli, uh, our uh, participants, and, uh, you know, they can ask for answers to questions that they have not been able to ask. So, uh, thank you, Professor Mijli. It has been indeed so kind. Uh, that you have spared so much of your valuable time for us. The other, uh, uh, you know, persons I would like to thank, we are grateful to Dr. Deba Debashish Rai Chaudhuri for rendering the opening song penned by Ram Mohan and sung with such graceful dignity. We haven't yet heard that, but after this, we are going to have the closing uh, uh, chanting of a shloka or stotra uh, by Professor Shushma Job of Pune Prarthana uh, Samaj. So I, I, you know, thank her in advance. Many thanks, of course, to Sri Amit Dash, a master of ceremonies, without whose technical expertise uh, this meeting could not have been set up. A special thanks to Shurajaya Gupta for designing the poster. To all members of the forum, we are indebted for their support and advice. To all participants this evening, a resounding thank you for your encouraging presence and participation in the proceedings. With this, I think, you know, we will uh, move to Professor Shushma Jo, who is going to recite the last stotra. And um, thank you very much, Jyati. And um, I wonder, um, I could put my email in the, the message type yes, box. Please. And yes. then everyone would have it. Yeah? Definitely. Okay. Yes. Yes, that, that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. So may I request uh, Dr. Shushma Job, could you please say the closing stotra? recording of this in YouTube, uh, which I think will be circulated. Please do share the word. There'll be more such programs. 
so it will be notified in due course so please do join us in our future programs and most important of all do stay at home and stay safe thank you everybody we are now thank closing you. the meeting Have i'm nice just evening. typing in my um, email yeah, i got yeah, it wrong it. the first time please look at the second one <laughs> i okay, managed to make a mistake we'll wait for you. okay that's gone in yes so that last one is correct <laughs> oh, that's fine so i hope thank people have noted much. that so uh, we'll definitely get in touch with you so thank you so much thank you everybody have a nice day have a nice evening have a nice afternoon wherever you are thank you we are closing it namaskar namaskar